there was this fear campaign that if Millet won, um, he would be the sort of fascist, you know, who would be a danger for democracy, just like um, people in the U.S. Um, talked about Donald Trump in recent years, or people in Brazil talked about uh, Jair Bolsonaro. Um, Millet was described as this uh, very dangerous uh, person who should be who should not be president. So this is the reason why I think uh, it was Massa particularly who got uh, more votes um, because Millet was sort of um, competing with the rest of the opposition for the anti-government vote. Uh, he won that. If you if you take that as a primary, as another primary, say then he won that because he beat Patricia Bullrich, who will not be in the second ballot. Uh, but the government sort of consolidated its support um, and got more votes, I think because of this fear campaign and because it tried to focus, it tried to avoid um, economics basically because um, the presidential candidate is the minister of economy, but our economy is in shambles right now. Uh, we have a 140% annual inflation rate um, an ongoing recession, uh, poverty rates that are through the roof. Um, so it was smart of the government to try to avoid uh, the economic themes and just focus on how dangerous Millet would be. And I think that's the reason why they got more votes. But it wasn't just the Spear campaign, right? Like Massa also engaged in a little bit of... Uh... I would say not exactly trickery, but almost like bribing people to vote for him when it really got down to the wire. Could, I, I was even reading a little bit about how, you know, people would show up to bus stations and train stations and see the government basically communicating, oh, if Malay, you know, comes into power, then here is how much your ticket will actually be because it'll no longer be subsidized by the government and he'll slash all of these programs, which is a fairly compelling pitch to people who are struggling financially could you tell us a little bit about like what was this very slimy campaign that Massa was running? Yeah, I mean, it was all very sketchy uh, and it wasn't just that. Um, it, for people who don't, who haven't been to Argentina, uh, bus tickets, uh, train tickets, subway tickets are highly subsidized, uh, particularly in Buenos Aires. And so a bus ride can cost something like um, seven cents of a dollar uh, when the true price should be something like a dollar. And so who's paying for that? Of course, taxpayers. Uh, it's only indirectly that they're paying for that with, for example, this monstrous inflation rate that we have, uh, but it's not something that you pay directly. And so what the government did was they, they actually installed um, um, yeah, like signs that said, you know, if uh, without a subsidy, you would be paying 10 times what you're paying today, um, which was a very, uh, not a direct, uh, but a very clear reference to um, the fiscal adjustment that both Millet and Bullrich uh, were proposing. Something else that um, Minister Massa did was he actually uh, cut taxes uh, in these past two months, uh, which is something that a uh, leftist, um, Peronist government, as we call it here, uh, would never do. Um, but this time they, they, they do it. Um, Minister Massa sort of slashed uh, income tax uh, for actually th this was mostly for people who are high earners uh, in Argentina, but he basically slashed it. Um, and he also um, implemented, well, he, they passed a law that Minister Massa se uh, sent to Congress, which would, um, and it, which is effective now and sort of gives um, money back to taxpayers, uh, uh, the VAT a tax, uh, it gives yeah. it back basically to consumers who use their debit card in supermarkets uh, and grocery stores. Um, so th there were lots of measures uh, put in place by the government, which are already fueling inflation because uh, the September rate, for example, was 12.7%. Uh, which was the highest uh, monthly rate in 30 years in Argentina. Um, wow, really? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah I know, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and before that, in August, we, we had, you know, surpassed our record uh, again. So this is like a continuous thing. You know, every month we get higher inflation than the previous one. And it, it is in part because of these measures. Um, they weren't enough to sort of... Um, calm markets down. Uh, there still was a run against the peso right before the election. 
um, for people to, to, to get a sense of, of what the exchange rate is here, uh, right after um, um, the August primaries, the dollar was trading at something like 600 pesos. Um, mm -hmm. But right before the election, uh, this past Sunday, uh, the dollar was trading at something like a thousand pesos. So there was a there was definitely a run against the peso, uh, which Minister Massa was unable to contain. Um, but still, you know, these measures that he took these these very populist measures, uh, they're very we're used to them. Uh, that that's probably why I didn't even mention them in the first place. You know, because we see that happen uh, repeatedly. Uh, and regardless of who the president is, uh, of what their political uh, affiliation is, they all try to take uh, implement measures that will get get them uh, the most votes right before the election. In the case of Masa, it was tax cuts, uh, which alongside this fear campaign, I think were very effective. So you could say uh, Malay has already delivered his first tax cut just through the fear of his election uh, by his <laughs> political opponents. But what you, you know, when when Malay, that's actually I'm sorry, that that's actually what he said. Because he, he has two oh, seats really? in Congress right now. Yeah, he has two seats in Congress. Uh, one of them is actually him. Um, yeah. And he actually voted in favor of the tax cuts. And he yeah. told people, you know, this was actually uh, his doing all around, that he was forcing Massa to <laughs> cut taxes through his agenda. Let's return to the election results for just a moment. Um, as you mentioned, the uh, front runner uh, or the top finisher here, Massa, Got about 30, almost 37 percent of the vote. Millet, 29.9 percent of the vote, almost 30 percent. Um, and then uh, Bullrich with almost 24 percent. So actually a fairly even split between the three. Could you just explain to us the difference between these three main, these three top finishing parties and candidates? Yeah, so basically, um, in Sergio Massa, you find uh, the, the representative of the, of the current administration. He is the, the Minister of Economy. Um, he is sort of like um, the, the shadow president, if you will, uh, because the, our president has largely uh, hmm. gone out of stage. He, he's doing nothing, really. Nobody really cares about what the president is doing since like the beginning of this year when he announced that he was not going to go for re-election. He's deeply unpopular. Uh, but Massa represents uh, the Peronist party, uh, that of Juan Domingo Perón, um, who back in the 40s and the 50s um, introduced uh, populist policies, uh, which it, it, it's hard to explain because the Peronist party um, has many faces. Um, some of them tend to be leftist. Some of them tend to be rightist. And Massa is a perfect example of that. Massa actually started his um, political career in a center-right party, uh, in a sort of libertarian party, really, back in the late 80s. Uh, and there are some people who still remember him, you know, as defending economic liberty, uh, like strongly, very strongly. But after joining the Peronist party, he sort of defended whoever uh, the Peronist in charge was, which made him... Uh, actually oppose, you know, uh, Nestor and Christina Kirchner, who were presidents uh, from 2003 to 2015. Um, he was a minister for that government. He then resigned. He ran uh, as a presidential candidate against uh, Kirchner's uh, candidate. Um, so he's been going back and forth, you know, between uh, leftist and rightist positions. Right now, he's the representative of the left in Argentina of the center left. Did you want to go to some audience questions, Zach? Yes, there's quite a few that have come in. One is from Naram Shanmuk. says, Masa is not center left. He's a left wing populist. I, from what you were describing, it sounded to me like, I, I think these terms get a little confusing across in different contexts because populist well, you know, giving out a bunch of goodies ahead of the election, that's a populist move. Here in America, we tend to think of populism as anti-establishment figures, but it's a little muddled here because he's part of the establishment, but he's also a populist. 
but right. uh, and I, I don't know that Millet, you know, he's often described as a populist. I don't know that he is a populist, but he's anti-establishment. Uh, is there anything people else you want to add to the Malay understanding as, of these terms? Yeah. People also describe Millet as like a fascist or in keeping with Bolsonaro, which is sort of not my understanding of the policies that Millet is promoting. I think people are very imprecise with their labels. Yeah. Um, so in terms of labeling, um, Massa is definitely the uh, establishment candidate. I mean, he's been part of, he's been in politics for decades. Um, he's actually calling for a government of national unity. You know, he's actually courting these parties, these Juntos por el Cambio parties that um, will not endorse Millet. He, he's trying to get them, um, you know, to be part of a potential government by him. Um, I would call Massa a populist, definitely, uh, because of the measures that he took, uh, that he's taking. Um, and I think at this point, he represents basically all of the left in Argentina, the center left, but also the far left, uh, and the left just left, you know, um, because they're, I mean, uh, with the far left candidate out for the runoff, um, anyone who feels leftist will vote for him. But again, I think Massa can, uh, Massa has, uh, switched, you know, skins in the past, uh, he has been rightist. He has been leftist. Um, and many people think he can actually, you know, make another um, 180 uh, degree turn. So we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, and then you were talking about Millet as sort of a, a Bolsonaro or Trumpish figure. Um, that's a very interesting discussion. Um, I understand why many people have compared Millet to Trump or Bolsonaro. I am not sure that that comparison is uh, completely accurate because yeah. neither Trump nor Bolsonaro were liberty. I mean, were self-described anarcho-capitalists. Mm. It's not that Millet. Certainly it's not, not that Millet. Right. It's not that Millet. You know. You know, calls himself uh, just a classical liberal or a libertarian. Like. He's, he's called himself an anarcho-capitalist. Hey, thanks for watching that clip of our talk with Marcos Falcone about the presidential candidacy of Javier Millet. You can watch the full conversation here or another clip over here.